Good. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the, is it the eighth, Pietro? The eighth and I'll focus on. And for the second time uh, in the series, we started in Rome two, two years ago now, uh, and we are back in Rome at the most wonderful uh, event of perhaps the Roman calendar, or at least to begin the summer, the Formula E race in Rome tomorrow. My name is Ryan O'Keefe. I am the Director of Communications of the NL Group, to those of you who do not know me. Um, thank you very much to all of you for coming. We have 42 influencers around the room today. It's a really fantastic, that is a record for us, by the way. It's wonderful to have all of you with us. Um, I'd like to actually, if it's not too much trouble, go around the room and ask each one of the 42, please, to just really, really quickly uh, give a name, a surname, and the country that you come from, uh, just so that we all get an idea about who we are uh, uh, sitting around the room. Okay, thank you. Hello, I'm Mirko Pallera, Ninja Marketing, and I'm from Italy. Hi, I'm Marco Merola, I'm from Italy. I'm a science journalist and also communication manager of W Science, which is a former spin-off of University of Rome La Sapienza and now is a company in the field of Internet of the Water Things. Hi everyone, I'm Nicola Andretto, um, Motoretto, I'm a blogger about motorcycles. Hi everybody, Andrea Bertaglio, I write for La Stampa, I'm from Italy, and uh, thank you for being here. Hi everyone, here is Simone Cosimi, contributor for Repubblica, YGQ, and uh, tech and innovation freelance. Thank you. Hello everybody, my name is Daniele Russolillo, I come from Italy. My focus is on smart city development, so also in mobility and energy worldwide. I am Luigi Centenaro from Italy. We apply innovation to professions. Hi, David Casalini, founder of Startup Italia from Italy, of course. Hi, everybody. I'm Rudy Bressa. I'm from Italy. I'm a freelance journalist and cover stories about uh, renewable and e-mobility. Hi, I'm Eliseo Salazar, ex-Formula One driver, and now I'm organizing the Formula E race in Santiago. I'm working for NL Chile and NL Worldwide. Hola, hi, mi, mi nombre es Leandro. My name is Leandro. I'm from Argentina. I work in a newspaper and digital media. Hi, I'm Aldo Pecora. I'm a journalist. This is my first focus on, and so I'm very happy. <laughs> Uh, to be here. Uh, I'm a journalist uh, focused on uh, financial innovation, fintech, and I'm the editor-in-chief for Mirko's <laughs> journal <laughs> magazine, <laughs> Ninja Marketing. Hi, my name is Gabriele Carbucicchio. I'm co-founder of Scooter. That is a startup that is introducing an innovative way to go around cities with a very strange three-wheeled scooter. Electric, electric scooter, of course. Hi everybody, my name is Valerio Bassan. I'm the head of Digital Forbes here in Italy, and I come from Italy. Hi everyone, my name is Jeremy Leggett. I'm from the UK and I'm here to apologize for Brexit. <laughs> and when I'm not doing that, I'm the founder of Solar Century. Hi everybody, my name is Tiziano Tassi. I'm from Caffeina and from Italy. Hello, my name is Guillermo Mas, and I came from um, Suez, Spain. Hi, my name is Luca Guzzabocca from Milan, Italy, and uh, I am founder of a startup, Italian startup, working on sustainable supply chains and sustainable motorsport events. Hello, everybody. I'm Olimpia Schiavone Pani, digital innovator in Mercedes Benz, Italy. Hi, my name is Simone Tornabene. I'm from Italy, and I'm director of strategy of Emilia. Hello, I'm Luca Conti from Italy. I'm a long-time blogger and uh, book author. Hi, I'm Angelo Balzretti and Enrico Pagani of Green Gene, the Formula E magazine from Italy and the UK. Hi, everyone. I'm Franz Russo from Italy. I'm a tech and social media blogger. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Davide Bernato. I'm a professor at the University of Catania. My field of experience is uh, computational social science. Hi everybody, I'm Camillo Sidiani from Italy and I'm a blogger and a marketing analyst at a startup Jobri. 
Hi, my name is Massimiliano, I'm from Italy. My interests uh, are uh, electric mobility and uh, smart grid. Hi, I'm Lorenzo Briotti, I'm journalist of uh, Blitz Quotidiano. Uh, I come from Italy. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Hi, I'm Francesco Paolo Russo, I come from Italy and uh, I'm a startupper. We, we work in Li Fi technology and uh, um, I'm an influencer marketing with uh, Twitter. Thank you. Great. What have we got? I'll introduce you. I'll introduce you. We need to come along here. Oh, we've been along here. We've been along here. Yeah. 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 You guys. We'll listen just the two of you. Go on. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Valkyria. I am a journalist from Brazil. I work in a publicly interested uh, digital platform, Projeto Colabora, uh, and our uh, main topic is sustainability. Hello, guys. I am Andres Mota from Colombia. I am a host, a radio host and TV and web host, and uh, we create uh, media content for companies. And um, we are very excited to be here because uh, we are now creating um, media content for for uh, Codensa Mijesa, uh, the partner of the Enel in Colombia, to showing the young people uh, the importance in uh, e-mobility. And uh, we start uh, uh, this this content uh, with a huge successful. And uh, now now it's very important to be here because our mayor uh, don't like to to change. To, to the, in, in this way. So uh, we have a, a challenge to, to show them the, the importance to, to be here and the e-mobility in Colombia. Thank you so much. for. Good. Well, thank you very much to everybody. So we have lots of Italians around the room, but actually representatives from eight countries. Uh, I'm the eighth because I come from South Africa. Um, there's one other person that I'd like to introduce who did not introduce herself. It's Michela Ceruti. She was the first lady to race in Formula E. So we also have the fortune of having... Uh, another racing driver in our midst, which is great. Um, so, as always at our NL Focus Ons, uh, we have some special guests. Uh, the first special guest who I'd like to introduce is Alberto Piglia. He's the head of our electric mobility um, product line within our new business line, NLX, and he's going to be talking in a moment uh, about the way in which we at NL are looking at electric mobility. We do not manufacture cars, um, but... If you look at the name, electric mobility, it has two halves, electric and mobility. We are very focused on electric, and Alberto will talk to us a little bit about that. Um, our keynote speaker today is going to be Brian Solis, who's come over from the United States. Uh, he lives in Silicon Valley. He's a member of uh, the World Economic Forum uh, Community on Sustainability, on mobility, uh, and he is an expert on all of these topics, and he's going to be giving us as we always have at an NL Focus on Meeting, a provocative speech with a presentation to launch a conversation as we always have uh, here at these NL Focus on Meetings. So I'm going to just start by uh, repeating the announcement that I made yesterday morning together with Alejandro Agag, the Chief Executive of Formula E, and Francesco Venturini, the Chief Executive of NLX, which is that Yesterday morning, uh, we signed the extension of our agreement, our partnership with Formula E, uh, and NL will remain a partner of Formula E for another five years until 2023, which is a really exciting uh, moment for us because we were one of the first partners to come into Formula E at the beginning. The second uh, interesting piece of news is that we are extending our partnership and up until now, we have been the official power partner of the championship. And starting from season five, we are also going to be the official smart charging technology partner. And this is really exciting because this is exactly what Alberto and his team do at NLX. We are working to ensure that we can provide the infrastructure and the systems and solutions that are going to enable electric mobility around the world in all the countries in which we operate. It's a really exciting moment for us, and it's fantastic to be, of course, in Rome, in our home city, celebrating it. Now, I am not an expert on electric mobility. Um, I'm also not an expert on telecoms. In fact, Alberto is an expert on both of them, because this is the world that he comes from. But I would like to, just before we start, just tell one story that I told uh, in Brussels, in fact, the first time I met Alberto, we traveled to Brussels together uh, to present to a bunch of MEPs um, 
some of our vision for electric mobility. And the story is this. The very first cell phone call was made using the technology that we have today was made in 1983 on a Motorola cell phone. That Motorola cell phone was 13 inches high, about the size of this microphone. It weighed 800 grams. It took 10 hours to charge. It gave us one hour of talking time and half an hour of standby time. And it cost $3,500, more or less, in 1983. That's about $10,000 today. Today, I have this. It's seven millimeters thick. It takes one hour to charge. It gives me 16 days of standby time and 21 hours of talk time. And I got it for free from Vodafone. This is technology evolution. And mainly, actually, it's battery evolution. And this is one of the key parts of the technology dynamic that we have to unlock for electric mobility. We have done that in 30 years, 35 years. That's a phenomenal jump forward. And what we are going to see with electric mobility, and we've already seen it because for the first four seasons of Formula E, the drivers had to change car halfway through the race because the battery of the car was not sufficient to get you through. From December 2018, the beginning of season five onwards, one car, the generation two car, to do the entire race in just four seasons. That's the technology jump that we have made just in four seasons of Formula E. And this is the magic of Formula E and particularly for NL, but we're not here to talk about NL really. We just want to talk about electric mobility. The magic of Formula E is that it is a testing ground, a playground even, if you like, for companies who wish to experiment and develop technology in order to help us to better the world and to advance the world of electric mobility. So to hear about it from the point of view of NLX, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Alberto Piglia. Alberto, thank you. Hello, hello. Good afternoon, uh, buon pomeriggio, welcome to Rome. I'm pretty excited about Formula E because one of the things, as I said, it, Formula E is actually in an area where I've been living to and I live. So I, this morning I, I managed to walk to the Formula E after having gone around the looking in it in other places. So it was really great pleasure having Formula E here, here in Rome. And um, I'll just entertain you or at least talk to you for 10 minutes um, about electric mobility. And, and uh, uh, Ryan introduced the fact that I'm, he said, an expert on electric mobility and telecom industry. I'm actually not an expert on neither or two. I'm an expert probably of uh, innovation and of change. Uh, I uh, was one of the people who was disrupted by the phone that uh, Ryan was, uh, was showing before. Uh, I was one of the people uh, who um, was disrupted by innovation that came at incredible speed, uh, having worked for a long time in my life uh, within Nokia. So even if the Nokia 3310 still has the best battery time uh, ever, I had, I mean, the, the disrupting phase. What, there's a lot of, uh, I think, similarities with what will happen in electric mobility uh, to what has happened in the telecom uh, industry. Uh, and this is why the future, I say the future is now. Um, today, I mean, it's minimal. Electric mobility, with the exception of few countries, uh, is, uh, is minimal. In, in Italy, the penetration is, is very low, it's at 1%. Uh, but uh, with the exception of few, few countries, like the Norways that are, are mentioned, uh, we don't see yet, uh, I mean, this big, big development of electric mobility. So why all this excitement around electric mobility? Well, I mean, there are reasons one for this. Um, the first one is driven by governments and cities. Governments and cities see in electric mobility a way to improve uh, pollution, which is basic uh, thing for uh, the people of our countries and the people of, uh, of our town. So they're moving more and more encouraging the development of electric mobility. And the European Union is doing this, but also in other countries this is happening. 
And this is from the side of uh, governments and municipalities, especially cities have got uh, a big interest in improving the quality of the air, and electric cars definitely improve the quality of the air of, uh, of, um, of the cities. Uh, then there's a push also from another side, which is a push from um, car manufacturers. We see a big uh, movement in uh, electric mobility. We talk to car manufacturers on a daily basis, globally, from China to California, moving into uh, more and more convinced into electric mobility. I mean, until a few years ago, you didn't have that much choice if you wanted to, um, to buy an electric uh, car. I mean, either you were really rich and you bought a high-end Tesla car, or you, you, ha you didn't have much choice. Now, I mean, we see, there's an announcement here, but we see the offer increasing dramatically, and uh, within a few years, we will be able to choose, with no problem, all car segments, as if we are choosing engines today. This will bring a, an exponential growth in electric mobility. Now, back to telecom industries. I mean, I remember great uh, um, uh, estimations of uh, how the penetration of uh, um, a telecom industry would go. The only thing I learned from that is that they were always wrong. Uh, because, uh, because, and even if done by really, really great people, really intelligent people, you just, it's very difficult to understand how uh, things will evolve. So you need to work on, on, on scenario basis. It can be quicker or slower depending on country policies, depending on customers, depending on, uh, on different things. One thing that will happen is that there's, there's going to be a considerable growth uh, from 2020 onwards uh, in, uh, um, in electric mobility in most markets, and this growth will be for sure exponential. The other thing to, to, to consider is that it's not going to cancel, I mean, all the other um, options. It's going to be complementary with the other options. It's got definitely some great benefits in some in certain areas of transportation, of city transportation in, uh, in particular. So it's going to be uh, part of uh, a wider stock. And I think the other thing, which I think will be the speaker after me talking more about it, it's going to be a way also to Mm, to let us understand how, I mean, the mobility will completely change to what we are, uh, we are, we are seeing today. I mean, it's going to, we, we, we all know it, uh, it's going to be completely a different way of mobility, much more towards access uh, uh, rather than possession, but we'll, you will get into that. Now, I want to look at uh, customer side of things. So, uh, the one thing that electric mobility uh, brings is a difference. And the difference is in the difference of the daily experience. For those who have um, electric vehicles, uh, drive electric vehicles, the one thing that is the first thing that you, you, you consider is time. You actually gain time, and this is uh, in time like Adam Smith is a precious resource, uh, for the simple fact that you don't go and fill the tank. That's not something you do. You actually, when you're at home, you charge and you spend your time, or while you go shopping or you're in office parking or you are at a supermarket, you are able to charge. That's, that's a, a completely different way of, uh, of um, cons cons considering, I mean, the way you use. It's like, I mean, you have water at home, you just bring on the tab. You don't have to go to the well to get water. That's the, the big difference that uh, this, this brings. And uh, Another thing that electric mobility um, allows is to better drive around the cities. Given the dramatically improved impact that it has on uh, um, pollution, cities are banning cars, or at least there are, ban there are days when cars, um, diesel cars or other cars can't get into the cities. This doesn't happen for electric vehicles. So you can circulate well because you don't pollute, you don't uh, make noise, which is another uh, important aspect that I'll see Uncle also in the Formal E tomorrow for those who will participate um, will, uh, will, uh, will consider. But in our view, uh, electric mobility and cars, electric cars, being a company who does 
electric, as, uh, as Ryan says, uh, um, is a, a way are completely different in concept to what they are today, uh, cars are today. We know that cars are more and more connected. This is something that gradually car manufacturers got, got into uh, introducing into cars. What electric vehicles will be, they will be vehicles which are connected to the web, but what is most important for us is connected to a grid. Uh, today, more or less, 90% of the time a car is parked and it's not used uh, because it's parked. Uh, a car, an electric vehicle which is parked, uh, which is connected to something that charges it, is basically an asset, a battery, that can allow to balance the grid, that can be allowed to work in a smart city in an intelligent way. That's why in, in the view of uh, an electric company like Enel and like Enelix, cars are batteries with wheels. Now, all this great world of exponential growth of cars will happen in the next years. But how can this happen, given it's still small? What are the barriers that uh, will uh, be overcome and to make this happen? Well, there are three of them, basically. The first one is so-called range anxiety. Then there's an issue of investment, of price, as I said before. And the third one is availability of charging station. Range anxiety is a simple thing said, called, I have X kilometers of miles available in my battery, and I need to do certain distance. I feel anxious, because if I am not able to do this, this is going to make me into trouble, because I just stop. Well, I mean, again, going back to what Ryan said, the speed of uh, increase of battery um, power and capability is dramatically growing. Uh, a few years ago, I mean, Enel did the first uh, charging station with Mercedes uh, uh, and Smart, it was in 2008. There was no charging station, so the guys from Mercedes came to us and we built this together with them. I mean, and the car at that time had limited, uh, of course, uh, um, autonomy. Years later, few years later, so it's not the 30 years of telecom, it's much less years. I mean, today, New Smart can do the 160 kilometers, which are more than enough to do what you need to do in, uh, in city moving, because uh, the moving is 40 kilometers more or less a day. So with a Smart, with any other car that is available today in the market, 95% of the use of range anxiety is done. So it's very good today in the area of uh, urban. We see, I mean, immense development in, uh, that is going on, and we'll see that this, this car autonomy will grow and grow so, so much that, I mean, you will have easily the five and over 600 kilometers to take out this issue of range anxiety. Price is today a barrier, as I said before. It's true that car, electric vehicles, motorbikes, I'm talking a lot of, about cars, but it's not just uh, uh, cars that I'm, fo I'm focusing on, because electric mobility will have an impact on, on scooters, on, on cars, on public transportation. Uh, today, I mean, you can consider the total cost of ownership, if you are in the city, is already pretty good, equivalent, if there are barriers to entering a city, if the municipality puts certain barriers to it, the initial investment is still higher. But this will dramatically decrease the initial investment due to the, and this is BNF uh, estimation, due to the decrease of the uh, price of uh, batteries, which will make probably in 2024, according to BNF, the price parity uh, there with, compared to others. Telecom industry, we knew, I, knew, I know that th these things happened more rapidly. The same thing happened uh, in the solar business for those who are from there. The third thing that you need to do is to put in place infrastructure. Because it's true that I charge at home or at office if it's possible. But if I don't have the opportunity to charge in uh, to have infrastructure in the public space, then it's pretty difficult for me to, 
uh, to charge. And that's why analysts take a really brave, brave move and bold move in Italy, and we'll do this in other markets also, to start an investment on public charging, putting down investment of up to 300 million, putting infrastructure in the countries with own money, no, no incentives, and putting so up to 7,000 by 2020 uh, infrastructure in place uh, in the city. Today, we actually, we are open, the format in Rome, we are now already have more than 120 charging station. With the Formula E, we managed to put four more uh, formula, uh, fast recharging stations with Wi-Fi, and this will increase dr dramatically. We are uh, signing agreements and starting installation according to this plan very rapidly. The only thing I know is that when we will meet at the uh, next NL Focus on in a uh, in few years' time, all these figures will be different because we will have learned so much about electric mobility. We will have learned so much about the new charging stations and the new ways of charging that all these things will change and will be different. But I think to make this happen, there's a few things that I think in 2018 are good to look at for electric mobility. First one is continue to increase in sales. The sales are small, so in 2018, but we see them growing double digit year on year. Battery prices will continue to go down. As said, we're starting to see Latin America is driving from that point of view. E-buses, e-taxis, public information, uh, public transportation moving more and more to electric vehicle. That's another thing to, to look at. Continuous announcement of car manufacturers on new cars available, new, uh, new power, new models, on and on. And we'll see, I think we'll, we'll really, I, I know we'll really see some exciting stuff coming up in the next um, years. A lot of focus on second life batteries, because I mean batteries are important. A battery in a car after eight years has still got a lot of life ahead of it, so it can be moved from a car and done to something else. And the last thing, as given NLX, I think, is, I mean, our uh, thing to see is how much, how good we will be in the implementation of the Italy plan. So with this, I leave, I thank you, and uh, I hope that this sparks a bit of conversation and we have a bit more afterwards. Grazie. Ron. Good. Thanks very much, Alberto. <clears throat> um, so, I don't want to spend any more time talking. Let's get to our keynote speech and the man who's going to provoke some thoughts and some debate for us and an interesting discussion. Brian, thanks very much for being with us. Well, it is my pleasure to be here. Uh, truth be told that this is my first ever visit to Rome, so thank you so much for having me. <laughs> I don't know how provocative this is going to be, but it is going to be honest. I am a digital analyst, and my day job is to study disruptive technology and its impact on business. Uh, I'm also a digital anthropologist, and so I study disruptive technology's impact on humanity, society, you and me, our lifestyle, our cultures, our values, our beliefs. And when I look at e-mobility, I look at it from several angles. I was first introduced to it as a consumer. So I'm a consumer of e-mobility and a big geek about it. And then I was, secondly, as my job, introduced to it as studying autonomous and self-driving vehicles uh, because I do believe that the future, somewhere down the line, is autonomous, it is electric, and it is shared because as Alberto mentioned, many cars actually just sit idle for a lot of time. They can leave, go charge themselves, they can drive around and pick up people, they can park outside of the city and come back and get you to save money. But I look forward to the conversation after this because I, like I said, am a geek about this and so I'm here to share what I think, but I'm also very curious to hear what you think as well. I call these times that we live in digital Darwinism. It's not just e-mobility. It's pretty much every sort of disruption that you could imagine is forcing society, forcing business, forcing behaviors to evolve. Some people are evolving. Some businesses are evolving. Many are not. 
And this is why we see so much disruption around the world. This is why we see so much disruption in every single industry is that many businesses, executives, consumers don't want to change. They're very happy with the way the world is and the whole idea of change is terrifying. So this is why I became an anthropologist was to better understand how do you get people to change. And we're seeing this play out in many, many ways. I think, uh, as was mentioned earlier, Brexit, uh, I apologize for the character we have in our White House in the United States <laughs> because he represents to me digital Darwinism. He's pushing a country backwards and he's placating to a group of people who don't want the world to progress. But it has to. You either evolve or you don't. Yesterday I had the privilege to see some very beautiful parts of Rome, some very historical parts of Rome. And there was one part yesterday where I went to the Fountain of Trevi and I, I made my wish. But uh, what I found most interesting was my tour guide, Laura. She said, you, sh you can appreciate the facade today because it spent many years being cleaned from the pollution. So now it's very white. And I thought, wow, what a perfect story or an example for e-mobility. You don't just breathe it, you see it. And believe it or not, sustainability of being in my work with the World Economic Forum, sustainability is not a driver for people to embrace e-mobility. It should be. Global warming, climate change should be a driver for this. But it's not. It's very human what's going on. As Ryan and Alberto mentioned, range anxiety. That example of Motorola is very funny for many reasons. 21 hour talk time on your phone today and people still have anxiety about battery life for their mobile devices. <laughs> I call this the four horsemen of the modern apocalypse. It's just, <laughs> these are the things that we really care about. We don't care about the, our carbon footprint. We don't care about the fact that we might be putting radiation next to our brain. We care about how much battery life we have for selfies. This is what the world has come to. As a consumer, when we look at technology disruption and we look at business innovation and opportunities, when you look at it from the consumer's perspective, those who embrace new technologies and those who do not, you clearly find a disruption gap. You find a gap in between where the world is going and where the world could go. And it's all driven by ourselves. I'll give you an example. I do live in Silicon Valley, so I get introduced to a lot of things. And, and a lot of that has to do where, with e-mobility being in my consumer life is because I, I just can't escape it in Silicon Valley. But I have a service near my home, and it is called Filled. I don't have to stop at a, a petrol station or a gas station, ever. I don't lose any time filling my car with gasoline because I have an app that brings petrol to me. Wherever my car is, I don't have to be there. A truck will come, just like Uber, and fill up my car, and I'm doing something else. I pay $1.99 for the service to come to me. And I have neighbors and friends who look at me and say, Brian, that's ridiculous. Why do you have someone fill your gas? And I say, well, is there something that I am missing that you love so much about spending time at a gas station? No. There is nothing so special about it. We can do better things with our time. But that's how ingrained, that's how deep it is in our consumer to think about making the shift to e-mobility. It's just part of their life is just gas. But also, one of the th biggest opportunities is not just about e-mobility, but transportation in general, is ownership. Quite frankly, you could make the, ar the economic argument that we m waste a tremendous amount of our income on owning a vehicle, when w in fact, we could share it. But that dynamic is so difficult for normal people to understand because since the early 1900s, ownership of a vehicle 
was a status symbol. And that status symbol continues to be with us today. Ownership is one of the challenges that I think we face. With the World Economic Forum, of course, we talked about climate change, global warming, sustainability, but it is not the driver for e-mobility. You have to tell them I'll call them back later. <laughs> <laughs> tell, tell them I'm in the middle of a room here. I'll have to call them back. I, uh, I have two small children at home, and the studying of the future weighs heavily on my ability and my passion to do something positive for the future. But this is unfortunately not an argument for expanding consumerism for e-mobility. Uh, nobody wants to talk about it. In fact, in the United States, we have a thing called coal rolling. I have never seen anything so ridiculous. Truck owners, Trump voters, transform their trucks where the fuel burns black smoke and they create these chimneys in the back of their truck. It's, a, it's, a, it's fashion, if you will, to show off how much black smoke that their truck blows. And it's a testament against, specifically when this began, against the Prius. That was their stand against e-mobility. So this is how stupid some consumers are, is that rather than protect their planet and understand that they're going to have children that have to live in it at some point, they do this as protest. A lot of my research in e-mobility, e there was a lot of optimists early on as this was evolving. I think 2021 was the year that they said electric vehicles are going to take over. In looking at NL's research, no, I think we're a little bit more at 50% about 2040. So we have some time, but there's a lot of work to do between now and then. And that's where a, a lot of my passion lies, is how do we get people to think and act differently? So I broke out this presentation into a few diff different stages. As you heard with Alberto, some of the challenges, we'll talk about some of the present, and then we'll talk about some of the future. One of the stories that's not told especially when we talk about sustainability and being green, is that electric vehicles today are actually very impactful on global warming in that they are double the impact in a negative way than the production of conventional cars. We have some work to do here because marketing it around a green angle is, is only one part of the solution. The other part of the solution is understanding how e-mobility fits into a lifestyle. So I can ask you, how many of you support the environment? Probably all of you, right? Yeah. How many of you are going to switch completely to e-mobility in the next two years? Yep, two. Yeah, exactly. It's very <laughs> difficult. Yeah, you, it's impossible for me as well. Yes, five years probably. Good. And I want to talk more about that uh, when we get into the discussion because – Personally, I have a slide here. You'll, you'll see what my purchase is going to be. But when you study why, for example, Germany is not doing as well as predicted with e-mobility, a lot of it's just absolute, it's a car culture. And the relationship with the car is petrol or gasoline, it's ownership, it's lifestyle, it's status. They are probably the quintessential country for showing exactly the challenges that the world faces. So we do have one of the things that I'll add to what Alberto mentioned is not just price or infrastructure or range, it's lifestyle. Lifestyle is a very big challenge for e-mobility. We have to get people to believe that their life is better with electric, that they can have not only what they know in terms of what it means to be transported somewhere, but the benefits of your life when you don't have to either own a car, fill it with petrol, or the benefits of sharing. I have many friends, again, I live in Silicon Valley, so everybody has a Tesla. Everybody has, you name it, Priuses were the first Ubers all around Silicon Valley. <laughs> it's, it, yeah, there's, there's, in fact, Teslas are very interesting. Teslas are part of the, they're not part of the Uber network, 
but they're part of the uh, what we call the black car network. So when you call a car, for example, to the airport, everybody has Teslas because it saves the, the organization a lot of money. Uh, plus, it's very cool to yeah, be. It's yeah, it's very cool. Well, interesting. If you go to Los Angeles, they'll tell you they don't want a Tesla because everybody has a Tesla. And Los Angeles is very image driven, very much care about what they drive and how they look. In San Francisco, we, want, we all want Teslas. It's a very interesting argument. And so this also shows why the United States will never be united. It's always divided. Right? This is the, the, the fact that people think a Tesla is cool in Silicon Valley, but in Los Angeles, it's everybody's car. Right? And this is a $150,000 car and not cool enough. But everybody. Yes, exactly, exactly. When we don't have a good infrastructure yet either. But every one of my friends who has a Tesla does this. When they, dr when they make trips, they plan their trips around charging stations. And this I always thought was fascinating. I'll say, so are you going to go here? No, we can't because it's not <laughs> on our path. And Tesla, for example, introduced a charting map so that you can plan your trips this way. And I thought that was quite brilliant to handle range anxiety. But yeah, I'm, we, we still have a lot of work to do. Now, remember that service where I could get petrol delivered, right? Yeah. You're going to have the same thing for energy. And we already have this in the United States. Uh, so it's an emergency service. You can't call it on demand. But if you <laughs> it's yet another attempt to help with range anxiety. But when you look at the math and how we use our transportation, whatever it is, whether it's a car, a bicycle, a scooter, an electric vehicle can handle more than 90% of the rides that we need. Right? And that's in today's technology. Two, three, four, five years, it's, it's 100%. So I don't know if you've seen this quote, but this is, I remember when the Volkswagen crisis happened and they were caught with cheating on diesel and petrol. But Elon Musk said that Volkswagen's mistake or Volkswagen's crime demonstrated that we've come to a point where we've reached the limits of what's possible with diesel and gasoline and that it's time to move to a new generation of technology. And I believe he's absolutely right. So remember when I said I was a consumer, my first everyday e-mobility transportation was this. It's called a boosted board. Skateboard that can go up to 37 kilometers per hour. I can go about 17 kilometers in distance before needing to charge. It can handle 100% of my urban mobility. And plus, it's really cool. Stand on it with a remote control. I can go forwards, I can go backwards, I can go up by all these steep hills in San Francisco. We have a new service in a lot of the major urban areas of, of the United States, Los Angeles, San Francisco, we're starting to see it in New York where electric scooters are now just available with an app. You unlock a, a nearby scooter, you get on it, you take it to where you're going, you leave it, and then the app locks it. The challenge is, is that what we're starting to see here is they're so popular, but there's this disregard for the, the scooter. People just throw it on the street when they're done with it, or some people think it's funny and they put it in trash cans. There's also protest from city citizens in the city that it's almost like gentrification. So for example, in San Francisco, you have this war of people who work for Google and Uber because they have these shuttles that come into San Francisco every day and they take employees to Silicon Valley and you have protesters all the time. Oh, get these buses out of here. We don't want technology and innovation in San Francisco. You're disrupting our neighborhoods. You're, you're, you're forcing teachers and policemen to move from their homes so that Google executives could live here. And we're seeing that same type of reaction to e-mobility in San Francisco where you have these bicycles and you have these scooters where people come and deliberately vandalize them because it shows as a sign of progress and evolution. In the United States, Uber just bought one of the biggest e-mobility bicycle companies called Jump. They paid $100 million for it, I think. For many reasons, they bought this as a way of improving Uber's 
business promise of helping you as a consumer get to where you need to go. But they're also using e-mobility as a way of saving the company's brand. Uh, for many who followed Uber during its rise under the CEO of Travis Kalanick, it was not necessarily the world's favorite company. But Uber sees e-mobility as a way of becoming a very popular company again. But also, they're investing not only in bicycles, but they're also starting to make investments in shared autonomous electric vehicles. When we study e-mobility in the urban areas, we see that people who ride bicycles, for example, anywhere, they look at the Netherlands, their average trip is less than 1.6 kilometers. If you take an Uber or Lyft, the average drive is about eight kilometers. On an e-bike, for example, the average trip is 4.3 kilometers. And so you start to see that the niches of e-mobility are going to fit into all aspects of our life. And they're going to even create new transportation opportunities for us. So this, I'm saving all of my pennies for this car, <laughs> if I can get access to it. I think they're only going to make a few hundred. This to me is the promise of true e-mobility and innovation. This is the new Tesla ro Roadster. It goes, I think, zero to 100 kilometers in about two seconds. I think the price of this is supposed to be $250,000. I think it has a 500 mile range. So I have to sell a lot of things. <laughs> and maybe I can get a down payment. <laughs> but it has four seats. And this for me is very important. This is a very cool car. But at the same time, do I even need to own a car? If an average car is parked 95% of the time, have we reached peak car? I mean, do we, you know, I don't know what the statistics here in Italy, but in the United States, most homes have 2.5 cars, maybe even more. But I wonder now, does e-mobility give us the opportunity to start exploring new business opportunities where mobility becomes a service? on demand. So for example, one of the things that I studied is the more we use apps like Uber or Lyft as a consumer, so this is nothing about e-mobility, but as a consumer, what those on-demand applications are teaching us is to become impatient. I call today's customer, the today's consumer, the accidental narcissist. One of the things that I studied in New York specifically is how long is too long to wait for an Uber before you open the Lyft app or a competitor app. In New York, that number is five minutes. If your Uber is more than five minutes away, you're going to open another app because you can't wait five minutes for a car to come and pick you up, which is fascinating, right? I mean, if, if you did that test a year ago, five minutes would have seemed like, I can't believe how fast that is. That's amazing. <laughs> So as a consumer, we're, we're changing. So we're not necessarily thinking about sustainability, climate change. We're thinking about ourselves. And so I think the more that e-mobility can play to the accidental narcissist, the more that we can play to what they're trying to do, their intent, who they are, their impatience, I think that mobility of a, as a service actually is a huge, huge opportunity. In fact, a lot of car makers see the writing on the wall. A lot of startups see the potential that every major automotive company around the world is in some way, shape, or form investing in some type of community service for mobility. Right now, they're doing it with fossil fuels and combustion engines. Some are looking at e-mobility for the future. Some startups are dedicating the creation of new types of vehicles specifically for mobile sharing new types of business models, and of course Lyft and Uber are big, big, big investors in this. The idea is that by 2030, these ideas of shared autonomous even, so not just shared vehicles, but shared autonomous electric vehicles are going to account for 25% of miles traveled. I think this is a very important deal because you see, I'm going to go back here to this slide, this company Spiri, I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, but it basically builds on the Uber pool mentality. So Uber pool is where you can share a car 
with someone going in the same direction as you so that you can save money. And Sperry built basically an e-mobile solution, an electric vehicle, for you to either rent the vehicle and then give people rides in the direction you're going so that your rental becomes free and they pay, or you just pay to drive the car by yourself. But the whole premise is that you will pick up passengers. So you, as the car driver, become an Uber-like driver, and which is fascinating, but it's changing the very concept of e-mobility. So this is what's really interesting, especially in Silicon Valley. You have a whole new generation, and I don't just mean kids. Just people who live technology lifestyles. So they do use Uber, they do use Lyft, they do use Facebook and Instagram and iPhones. And those are the early adopters of what we're seeing with e-mobility solutions today. They're the first to embrace boosted skateboards. They're the first to embrace these e-bikes. They're the first to embrace the scooters. And that creates this natural disruption between traditional consumers and this new generation of consumers. We've seen and we've had many discussions about solar roads that are even starting to pop up all over the place. While they're very expensive, I think that they do demonstrate just what's possible with all of the wasted space that we have around us that could produce energy. As Alberto talked about, there are cities that are going to start banning combustion engines for all the right reasons, right? And of course, people are upset. What? My precious car, I won't be able to drive it in the city. But the point of it is it's better for the city. It's better for all of us. But I think even from an else position, when I think about this, e-mobility opens the door for new types of relationships between utilities and consumers. Right? Who's, who's going to door to door to person to person talking to them about what we're talking about today? Nobody. Yet... If I sat and had coffee with someone and talked to them about all of the benefits that they would have from renting an electric scooter or renting an electric bicycle, and all of the time that we could add up that they will save over, over a year, and have a conversation about what would you do with three and a half hours of time that you'd get back? Maybe spend more time with your loved one, maybe spend more time with your kids, maybe take more selfies, I don't know. <laughs> but there is, there's a value proposition that we're not talking about, and I see that as creating new opportunities, just as this whole idea that I, I, I was briefed about vehicle-to-grid technology recently, and that just blew my mind, the fact that cars can become part of a smart grid, part of a two-way grid to give energy back is incredible. So the possibilities here from a technological standpoint are great. I think also the possibilities, and. All, I mean, we're in a room full of influencers. The possibility for all of you to influence the mindsets and the behavior sets of tomorrow's e-mobility consumer is really where this is going, is that each one of us has the opportunity to convince people not of the benefits of giving up combustion, but the benefits of now living a new type of lifestyle. So as we've seen with Alberto's presentation, battery prices are dropping Density is rising. Urban dwellers are er early adopters for this, and they're ready to experiment just because they're early adopters and they're ready to experiment with everything. <coughs> Costs are dropping across the board for generating and storing energy, also for renewables. And at the same time, technology that makes cars autonomous, that makes them self-driving, those prices are also declining. We don't hear those stories so much in the United States. In fact, we had in Arizona... Uh, a self-driving test car for Uber kill a pedestrian. And of course, all of the news was evil Uber. And it's true, Uber was evil, but not for that reason. That, I mean, that was, a pedestrian at night walked right in front of a car that was at pretty much full speed. It's hard to, for even a human to avoid. But the news is going to make it difficult for us to influence the adoption of self-driving technology just like the news makes it difficult to just popularize the mainstream information, when the mainstream story really is here, what does transportation mean? <coughs> just like every industry that's being disrupted, whether it's finance, whether it's insurance, well, you name it, whether it's healthcare, pharmaceuticals, it's always the same story. Some people don't want change, some people really want change. We're now at a crossroads where we actually are going to make decisions about ourselves and also watch those around us. Are you going to move to an electric vehicle? Are you going to jump in 
or like me, start with a skateboard <laughs> and then an e-bicycle. I think that our pillars for the conversation can be everything from battery prices and innovation because those are the core of e-mobility, infrastructure being essential to scale, costs, steering adoption from ownership to sharing, utilities, innovating and creating new types of consumer relationships, and lastly, there's a lot of lifestyle marketing, a lot of lifestyle communications that has to happen in order to drive adoption. I think that's where, personally, I see a lot of the challenge. So with that, I'll give the microphone to Ryan. I'm looking forward to hearing your conversation. I mean, for me, the home of the Renaissance is fascinating. I think of this as philosophical. We're at this crossroads. We're going to talk about the future of e-mobility. Now all we need are glasses of wine. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Thanks, Brian. So I'm sure everybody takes away something uh, particular, personal, special from the two speeches we've heard. I think what I would like to say is I really like the honesty. We do not have the solutions yet. We have a lot of problems. We are working to find the solutions. This, to me, was the, that's the message that, that I take from this. I think it's a really exciting time uh, to be working in the energy industry, but just to be people sitting in a room talking about a subject like this, this is really interesting. And I guess, again, in the context of the race that we're gonna see uh, tomorrow here in Rome, riding these ultra high tech futuristic cars through the ancient city of Rome. It's a beautiful idea uh, and it's really exciting. So as usual, we'd like to open up the floor now um, and we wanna get a discussion going. We wanna have a conversation, we wanna share ideas, we wanna provoke uh, some thoughts, some debate. Um, so how many microphones do we have, by the way? It's not possible that we only have one microphone. There's one there, okay, well, that's fine. So we've got two microphones. Who would like to kick us off with a question for Brian or the question for Alberto? It's not possible that after all of that talking, nobody has any questions. Excellent, here we go. Um, in 2050, uh, the world, uh, two thirds of the world population will live in urban areas. Uh, I'm not sure if it's for Brian or Alberto. Um, uh, do you think sh uh, sharing electric cars is going to be enough to reduce congestion and to reduce the, the greenhouse gases uh, uh, emissions or, or do you think uh, uh, we need something more like electric buses because nobody talk about buses and, and public transportation that I think is, is the key to, to, to improve the life of everyone. So, Alberto, and then actually, Jose Miranda back there. Where's he gone? Is he coming up Yeah, I... Uh... Yes, yeah, so um, I did mention electric buses yes, and, uh, and electric <laughs> taxis uh, because, I mean, uh, in, for example, uh, just, no, 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 I was, I was saying, no, 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 because it's, it's irrelevant because I have this discussion because, for example, in Italy, there's 37 million vehicles, so that's more than uh, the U.S. probably. I don't know the, the math for the families because I don't know how many families there are. A lot. I mean, the uh, problem is, the solution is not changing 37 million vehicles into 37 million electric vehicles. That's absolutely not the solution. What Brian has, has shown us is, uh, I mean, so sharing, uh, uh, I mean, 2050, it's going to be a completely different world of, uh, of mobility. So will it help? I, I think two things. It's not the only solution. Uh, one solution for, for you guys in Brazil is that by 2050, NL will be completely decarbonized. So that's, uh, that will help a lot because uh, we will uh, all have uh, all green uh, energy. Um, and then obviously it's, it's public transportation where, I mean, the concept, the sheer concept of public transportation, again, it's not just electric transportation. It's, it's also the way we, the paradigm that we have is the one of the omnibus, uh, which was driven by horses. 
and so on. That was the size, and you get in, and in that size, you all get onto the bus, and you go from A to Z, uh, going through all the letters of the alphabet. That's not going to be what is going to happen. There are already countries there and cities, Helsinki, for example, Lisbon, experimenting new ways of, of doing it. So where you actually manage to book your ride and go with others and do the ride, and the municipality doesn't need to invest in a big electric bus, but it can invest in a bus which is smaller and which is more utilized and better utilized. So quick answer is no, it's not going to be just that. Uh, there's going to be much less, uh, the production will go completely green of, of energy that will help, uh, and then public transportation, which will be completely different from now. I, I'm sure that Brian has a lot to add. Well, we also have someone else who is going to answer too. Uh, well, I'll just I'll add an interesting tidbit, because I also study the, you know, the future of society. And by 2030, uh, IKEA's innovation arm published some very interesting research that said that because of the density of urban areas, <laughs> there's not only too many cars, there's also not enough places to live. Uh, and some of the big investments that are happening are in what's being called co-living, where they're transforming apartment buildings into spaces for multiple families to live and have shared areas rather than having their own areas. And I think once that starts to happen, I think the mindset for shared mobility also just becomes a natural extension of that lifestyle. But it's a new type of lifestyle. And it's, it's, a, it's, it's the kind of debate that if we go down to a bar and we say, hey, uh, do, would you ever see not having a car and sharing a car? It, 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 we'll debate all night long because we go, no, never, never lose my car. But the reality is there's a whole new generation of families that are growing up that are just living life differently. And I think that that is part of also the solution is that, and also buses, by the way, I've, I've studied in, in my, my autonomous research, buses that are being used on fixed paths to just, uh, they're already operating, to just transport people so that they don't use Ubers. And they did these tests as a way to compete against Ubers to stop bringing in cars from the outside into these areas and just providing fixed transportation to common destinations. Yes, I Hi, Jose Miranda, head of communication of NL Chile in Santiago de Chile. Where in our, in our case, we have a big experience with the electric buses and the transportation because three years ago, we started with a special alliance with BYD, even Eliseo now working with BYD. And our experience is fantastic because now we are working with the government in a special tender uh, for all the transportation in Santiago and we are working to find a way to put in this year or next year 1,000 of buses, electric buses in Chile. This is a big tra transformation for the city, of course. Yeah, maybe. Uh, no, no. Go, go. Yeah, a question from Brian. Yes, it is a general question. It is not a technical question. I've been working on engage people on sustainability since 15 years ago and uh, I realized that there is a technical component of the engagement which are the technical drivers, you know, the cost, uh, the technology, the infrastructure and blah, 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 blah. And the second are the emotional components, no? which are maybe the most, uh, you know, important to take into consideration when you talk about uh, uh, circular economy, mobility and so on. What do you think about which is the trade-off between the two components? Well, you know, I was telling this story yesterday that there's, for me, it's, 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 it's both. So I'll speak as a consumer and then as, as an analyst. One of the things that I found really interesting about this is that being on the sustainability panel, of course, you're inclined to want to live a sustainable life. I found it fascinating how difficult it was as a consumer to understand how to make those decisions. Uh, you, you have general messages for global warming and climate change, but you don't have specifics of, like, what does it mean every single day? So I'll, I'll give you an example. I first looked into buying a Tesla uh, just simply because it was, I thought it was so cool. Uh, then I did the math. How much it costs to own that? Then you start to look at all of the things that Tesla's going to introduce, like the power wall. I don't know if you've seen this, but they can install these big banks on your, on your walls that can store energy for your house to last a couple of days should the power go out. Now they've also introduced solar tiles for your roof, which are very stylish, so very expensive. And so after doing the math of buying the car, buying the wall, buying the solar panels, because I want to live the ecosystem, 
it was financially not doable uh, for me. And there was no understanding of financial partners who can lease these technologies to you or utility companies that can help you find the incentives to embrace this. So it wasn't even just the emotion. It was just the understanding of what it actually takes to live a much more sustainable life in, in a new energy world. On the emotional side of thing, things, I don't know how to answer that question. Because I think if you solve that question, you would also prevent things like Brexit or Trump because it's, it's, it's a thing about progress. People have an emotional attachment to what is and what they know and what they've always known. And we're asking them to change. And I think when we can understand that this is, none of this is a threat. All of this is designed not just to make your life better, but the world better. Don't you have kids? Don't you want them to live in a great world? And the answer is like, oh yeah, you know, it's just that we've never had to talk about that. We've not, never talked about transportation from anything other than it being sort of an extension of yourself, right? Uh, and that, that's where these conversations, I think, have to start going. I'm a big advocate of uh, electric mobility. Of course, I drive an electric car for more than a year now. I, I think, you know, it couldn't be better. I mean, I've driven cars all my life. I've driven Formula One cars. But I think, you know, the, just the sensation of uh, having, you know, instant torque, you know, the cars accelerate a lot faster than a conventional car and also no noise. I think, you know, it's, it's, it's so clear that that's, that's the way. One, I more or less agree with everything you've said for the future, but I think one hurdle we have is that a lot of countries have a specific taxes on, on fuel, you know. In, in my country, in Chile, you know, we, we, we have fuel at four, $4 a gallon, you know, because more than half, 55% uh, 50, of that is just taxes, you know. So when, when the electric mobility start really going on, you know, and we have hopefully, you know, 25, 30%, they're going to start losing a lot of money on taxes. You know? So we will have to see then what happened, because you know, if they start taxing cars on mileage, if they're going to start taxing cars, you know, on, on the original cost. So that's, that's another hurdle that we'll have to see. Though all the rest that you guys have said, you know, I completely agree. I think there's nothing better than driving an electric car, and it's, it's, it's not, uh, it's not uh, all people say it's the future. No, it's, it's not the future. It's the present that is going to happen a lot sooner, you know. Yeah. We are, this is Netflix and uh, the other cars are Blockbuster. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> yeah, I'll just say, it's, uh, yeah, I, 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 I totally agree. There we go, yes. Uh, the thing about taxes is, I don't know how it is here, but I've seen it around the world, uh, and especially in the United States, and it's the opposite. Right now, there's incentives yeah. for the consumer to go to electric, so they'll personally get, yeah, they get, they get a lot of cash and they get tax breaks uh, over time. Uh, the thing, though, that I've, I'm worried about, too, and I, I, I didn't put this in there because I, I, I wanted to try to stay a little bit away from politics, but it is important. I don't know how it will play out in Europe, but I do know in the United States that fossil fuel companies are going to fight very dirty to prevent e-mobility from gaining uh, adoption very quickly. And we saw that with the Honda EV uh, early on, is that that, that, that was a promising that, that we could have been in a whole different place with e-mobility in the United States had the Honda EV, uh, EV1 been allowed to run its course, but instead they got killed intentionally. Sorry, just before we go to the next question, I'd just like to make one comment on this because I think it was Victor Hugo who said, there is no army in the world that is strong enough to fight and prevent an idea whose time has come. And I think that as Elisio says, electric mobility is not the future, it's the present, it's here. These people who argue that the world is still flat, it's kind of tedious. And, you know, I just think that, yes, one of the wonderful things about the world is the fact that everybody has different ideas. And that's what sparks innovation and debate. And it's how we improve things. So the fact that everybody has different ideas is very valuable, in fact. But, you know, we need to couple that with intelligence and with some kind of vision of the future and with something which is... Uh, I don't necessarily say altruistic, but at least a sense of community and the fact that we're all in this together. Um, you know, if there's somebody who's fighting their own agenda and preventing the world from moving forward, that's clearly value destructive. Anyway, please. Okay. Thank you so much for, 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 the, for the words. Uh, and, and thank you, because uh, I, I love the, the, the argument, the, 
the dynamic of the technology because it means that uh, we are in the right place now, you know. So, um, because, I don't know, I'm, uh, in my country, um, just, we, we are just starting the, the e-mobility. It's just, just starting the, you, 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 saw, you, you can see the e-bikes and, you know, some cars, 20 taxis or 40, 40 ta taxis in, in all countries, and that's it. So we are starting... And, uh, and we, we have a, a challenge to communicate these this, this, this kind of things. And I want to, I want to share with, with you uh, one uh, experiment that we, 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 do, we did um, last year. That we, we, we are influencer, influencers and create a media content for entertainment. So Codensa uh, work with us now to create a show uh, for entertainment and lifestyle, because I think it's a very important argument to 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 put this concept in the in the society, the lifestyle, the status, and uh, and we create a show to uh, to explain in the life, not not for for the technologies, you know, uh, for lifestyle uh, arguments with lifestyle arguments, to put this this in the in the people, and, and we receive a, a lot of uh, a good. Um, I don't know how to say uh, good um, good news, good uh, good things with uh, with with the people, and uh, but I want to ask you something: uh, why or how um, we can do more? Um, we we can have more reach about that, more uh, accept to 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 young people to to put this concept in in very lifestyle way or cool coolness way, the immobility. The sharing, but this sharing is not cool right now, you know. So we, we can do that. Does anybody know who Kim Kardashian is? Yeah. yeah. So I think we need to give get her as a spokesperson, uh, and then the whole world will change overnight. I, I, it's, I don't know the answer to this. I think, in fact, this is a good conversation for all of us to try to answer, I think, is that I think Formula E is a very good start. If I think back about what Formula One did for automotive in innovation and creating automotive enthusiasts and the whole ecosystem of magazines and television shows around it, I see the promise of Formula E having the same effect. The coolness of e-mobility, the, the performance of e-mobility. I mean, for the next season, going to one battery is a huge deal because I think a lot of times if you have anyone who suffers from cognitive bias, for them... You know, one person in the room might say, well, two batteries, that makes sense. You know, we're, we're, we're innovating. We're, we're breaking new ground. And another person might say, two batteries. This is exactly what the problem is with the mobility. And we have to keep showing people in the coolest of ways in, in, in content that's created, you know, about boosted boards, about jump bicycles, about uh, bird scooters, all of these things. They're really cool. There's this new company in San Francisco that makes, uh, and I told Pietro that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get him one because he rides a bicycle here in Italy, a folding bicycle, that it is this tiny thing that looks like two metal arms and you open it, out come two wheels, a seat and handlebars, and you can scoot around really fast in Italy going for, for many, many, many kilometers without having to recharge it. Those stories have to get out and they have to be shown by all of the cool people in the world. The, the irony of this is that in the United States, we had these things called hoverboards, which were these little things you stand on, not like Segway, but little, yeah, little two-wheel things. And that was launched by a Kardashian. And overnight, everybody had to have these things. And so I think, uh, you know, and I think back to the days of the Segway. Like that, those things are really cool, too. But it's just trying to get them across what we call in Silicon Valley crossing the chasm between early adopters and the early market majority. But I think it's people like you and it's people like us in the room having, having these conversations, creating cool new content, getting people to see that it's a lifestyle and I want to be part of that lifestyle. That's, I think that's a, a good amount of work. And I'm very proud of what's happening here with Formula E because I think that's also another great start. Thanks. Let's take one more question, then we're going to go to the web because we've got a few, a few questions coming. By the way, one reason why your, those little scooters probably haven't taken off in Rome yet is because you get amazzato by the cars driving around here. If you try one of those, it's not a good idea. Yeah, I, <laughs> I had a, a thought about the economics, you know, the, the, your point about the trio of solar and batteries and, uh, and EV not working economically. 
I'm guessing you're, th you're thinking about payback there because, um, you know, just one anecdote from my own life. Um, Solar Century is, uh, many people don't know this, but we're behind the IKEA brand. So we do two, two parts of the leg. Uh, for IKEA, uh, we partnered with, with them. We do the solar roof and we do the batteries. Um, and we launched our battery offering with them on 2nd of August uh, last year. The reason that date is in my mind is because on the 1st of August, one of our utilities, Centrica, had to put, I felt the need to put up its electricity prices um, by 25%, I think it was. Uh, and the very next day when we announced the, the deal, uh, we talked about the economics and with the right combination, we could bring down people's electricity prices by, wait for it, 70%. So that is, you know, uh, I think it's a challenge for us. You, you know, we, we, we've got to, uh, I mean, you, you ha you are, these things are assets. You have the solar roof, you have the batteries, they're an asset. Now, um, just to quickly finish the point, because I, I think it's going to be terribly important for how quickly this plays out. What we found was, you know, the solar roofs were selling. IKEA wants to be the number one retailer of, of solar roofs in the world. So, you know, it's a big, hairy, audacious goal. Um, uh, but the roofs were not selling as well as either of us would have wanted. When the batteries came out, then the level of demand went up. And here's my bet. I can't prove it yet. But when, I'm sure, you know, somebody is going to add the car to the, 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 the trio of technologies other than Tesla. When that happens, I bet there'll be another step up as well. So it's, you know, I think it's our, our challenge is savings, not, uh, you know, we've got to sell that, not the payback. Yeah. I'll, I'll just say absolutely, and I hope so. Uh, I think although that your utility company going up 25% the day before that announcement probably couldn't have helped you <laughs> any more, right? I, mean, I was like, thank you, thank you. Uh, well, you know. My, my challenge, and I think most consumer challenges, and I don't know how it is here, but in the United States, do, let me ask you something. Does, I, does Ikea do financing? Yeah. Yeah, see, that's, that's, that's a big deal because for us, what I did the math, it wasn't just about payback or savings. It was how do I come up with $350,000 because that's what it was going to cost me to make that investment in the, in the power wall and also my, my roof. Is there weren't there, there, there's no inf when we talk about energy infrastructure that's one thing but when we talk about changing lifestyles and having an infrastructure to enable that so for example oh, Brian you want a solar roof fantastic well we can do that for you for zero percent financing you know I I think that in, that type of in, in infrastructure is, is also going to be needed. Yeah, I, I think I mean we we're, we're getting we will get there uh, when we talk about uh, our vision of batteries with wheels, we've done experimentation in Copenhagen where uh, given the grid services offered by the car to the, um, the TSO, so the operator, the electricity operator, you get money back. And part of the, that money goes back to the owner of the car. Uh, similarly, we, Enel has uh, just uh, bought a Californian uh, a company called eMotorworks. Uh, uh, it's pretty strong, pretty good in, uh, in smart charging. And they're already offering Californian customers uh, money back because of their ability to capture the best prices for energy because they have intelligent digital systems that manage uh, the car charging. So, I mean, they charge when the price is better, and, and, and that's the simple deal. The vehicle to grid is even more uh, an evolution. You actually are able to give back energy or at least give back um, increase the, 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 the frequency, so do frequency regulation to, to the grid, allowing mm, to get some money back. So it's things that will evolve much more rapidly than, than what we actually think, also because they will unite with uh, solar and with storage. And this will going to happen a lot in the um, in industrial world. I mean, we're already having customers from uh, all over the world, Italy we're talking, but also U.S. Uh, asking to us solution where I mean, they can manage their, uh, the electricity they have, uh, but they, all, they sp often have spare electricity. So with that spare power, what can they do? They can offer charge to their customers. And can you help us manage them? And we say, yes, we can help them manage that. Good. Thanks, Alberto. Let's have a look at some questions uh, on the web. Um, I know that the, some have already come in. Uh, Pietro, you're killing me. <laughs> <laughs> Eccoci. Right, so from Victor, how to optimize the electric distribution? 
to build proper net, I think grid, to recharge electric vehicles. Alberto, do you want to, <laughs> do you want to talk about it? It's a pity that we don't have anybody here from our infrastructure no, and network Brian, business. But... No, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no that, that's a simple. It's actually much more simple than what people think. Uh, there's, there's, two, there's two points to it. First, uh, I, get, I get two questions on this. The first one is that, okay, electric vehicle will grow. Uh, do you have enough power to charge them? And the answer is yes. I mean, if you do the projections today, in it I do it in Italy, with one million electric vehicle, that's less than 1% of what we consume in, uh, in tetrawatt hour uh, for uh, the country. That's one million vehicle. And so, absolutely manageable. The second question is this one. So how do you manage the grid? And that's where digital comebacks and digital intelligence. Yeah. So uh, Enel has invested, our infrastructure network guys have invested in, long, in, in, in smart, uh, smart grid. The infrastructure we have, Enel has, in, in, in is placing in, in the cities uh, and also in the, in, the, in the houses or in the companies is a smart one. It's connected. We actually have a central system called AMM, electric mobility system, that manages the charging. So we are able to charge a car in a certain moment or not charge a car in another moment. And by doing this, we're able to balance the grid. We, will, we are able to aggregate cars and do demand response services. And this is just the beginning because even here as evolution will, uh, and technological evolution will, will go on, I mean, we will be able to even give back energy to the grid in the future. So it's actually a much a non problem, you have to plan, you have to work together with the distributors to do it. So it's not something that uh, uh, it, it just happened. You have to have planning, you have to have digital inte intelligence to do it, but it's something that from Analyx is uh, um, pretty much ahead on. I think if I can just give one quick shout out to Enel on this, Italy is the country in the world, is the only country in the world with a 100% digitized grid. And there are countries, first world countries, we're not talking about third world backwards places, um, who are rolling out smart meters now in 2018, only today. NL did it in 2002 and digitized fully the entire Italian grid. Now, what does that do? That allows the bi-directional flow of energy and information across the grid. And that's what enables all of this stuff that Alberto was talking about. That's the reason why the digitized grid, enabled in part by smart metering, is so important. Um, and as we stand here today, Italy is the only country in the world with a fully digitized grid at a national level. Um, let's see the next question uh, from the web. Pietro, vai. No. Mamma mia. Should we do a drum roll? <laughs> <laughs> the same one. No, next one. Let's go. Come on. <laughs> right, okay. So how important is it for NL and Formula E to bring the future technologies to a city with an ancient history such as Rome? So, uh, Bri Brian, I think, Brian, do you want to? Yeah, well, again, you know, I've been... Uh, I've been in uh, model racing all my life, and I, I know the Formula One wanted for decades, you know, to race in the middle of Paris, in the middle of Rome, and it, was, uh, it could never be done because of the pollution, because of all the inconvenience of, uh, of petrol, yeah, the noise. So how important, I think, is, uh, is what you, Brian, were saying, you know, and, and our friend here, is to show the world, you know, that... Uh, that uh, electric mobility is cool, you know, that these cars are as fast, as efficient, as um, colorful, you know, that, as the Formula One cars. You know, you said that Formula One play a big role in, in uh, showcasing, you know, the innovation of cars. You know, I, I used to live in Indianapolis, and in Indianapolis, 1911, you know, they developed the first uh, uh, mirror, you know, for, for a car, and then all the, all the revolutions came through racing. And I think that's why it's so important. You know, we know that uh, we're going to disrupt people, we're going to disrupt neighbors, we're going to disrupt the traffic. But the, the cool effect that you're, when you're showing 
that uh, a car race can come to an ancient city, an eternal city like Rome, I think it's, it's, it's brilliant, you know, and I think Enlil is, uh, is, is an absolutely in the right way to, to promote it. I think there's another interesting point here, which Alejandro Agag, the chief executive of Formula E, he makes this point all the time. Electric mobility is for the people. It is actually a car which everyday people in everyday cities all around the world are going to be driving. Right, they're not going to be driving at 250 kilometers an hour, and they're not going to be driving in the monoposto. But electric vehicles are for people. They need to move in cities, and that's the reason why it's so important that Formula E uh, races in cities. So it's, um, and, and, you know, for NL, obviously, that's what we're trying to do. That's the job that Alberto has, is to ensure that we're putting in place the systems that are going to enable the people of the city of Rome, and not just Rome, and not just the cities on the calendar of Formula E, but all around the world to be able to drive comfortably with electric vehicles. Yeah, I'll probably repeat what uh, has already been said. First is the emotional part, because uh, yeah, it, it is an emotional part. I mean, uh, uh, driving an electric vehicle, and this is the real emotional part, who drives an electric vehicle, and you don't need to drive a Formula E car, and you don't need to drive a Tesla. You can drive also uh, other... Uh, let's say lower end electric vehicle is uh, an amazing experience for the and it's difficult to come back to to the experience of non-driving electric vehicle so the first one is emotional it's important because because of emotional i mean i think i don't know uh, the, the, the days but it, the the formula got sold out in rome at incredible speed and that shows how how i mean people are engaged and interested uh, into it so, so that's the first thing the second thing is uh, Less emotional, it's, it's, it's showing, uh, I mean, the, testing the technologies. Brian, uh, Ryan said it at the beginning. So uh, we actually are introducing uh, fast charging technologies which are not yet in the market uh, informally next year. And these will be coming into the market very rapidly. So as in, in the world of racing, uh, I mean, it's, uh, it's a, a gym to exercise uh, uh, the technology and our intention, both in Formula E and also in Moto E, is to do that and bring these uh, charging solutions into the world of uh, commercial. And last, being our, uh, uh, it's important for us for the, the last region, which is, uh, I mean, it will enable us to put infrastructure in place in Rome, uh, which is something that is uh, is needed because uh, today we have 120 charging station. With Formula E, which plays four, four, four fast charging stations, we already had one. And I think with, with all this movement, we will be enabled, the, the city municipality will, will open up the opportunity to put more infrastructure. And if you put more infrastructure in a city like, uh, if you are able to put more infrastructure in a city like Rome, then people will be driving uh, electric vehicles around. So it, you actually activate a virtual circle. Okay. Um, first of all, I would like to add um, a confirmation, uh, an affirmation, a concrete example on the presentation of Alberto and Brian uh, on the automotive size, actually, because uh, as I told before, I'm part of the Daimler group. And as Daimler, we, together with Henel, we are really nearly here, actually. We, we always talk about the future, but probably with, uh, with the smart example, we can say that we are already in the new future of mobility. So we have developed as an LX specific uh, company inside the Daimler Group, which is the name is CASE, and CASE is exactly connected, autonomous, share and service, uh, and electric cars. So we believe that electric mobility is the main focus uh, of the future together with share and, and also services and autonomous. So all these items together uh, are already in, now in the market with Smart. Uh, I don't know if everybody know, but from next year, uh, Smart will be just produced like electric. So I mean, uh, Smart will be just electric and we have already all the shared service uh, with the fact that you can also have uh, the possibility to share the car without the keys with an app uh, with your friends, your family, or your actually your, um, your colleagues. So um, I really believe that the presentation that we have seen today are, uh, we are not in the future, but we really we are really near to the future. 
And uh, the question that I have uh, for Brian is uh, on the communication sides, um, actually on the marketing perspective, uh, also we are facing a big revolution actually. It's not just product, it's not just a business model, but it's also we are facing a big uh, change on the communication sides. So in our company, we are working very hardly on driving marketing driven, data driven, customer approach, and digital centric. Uh, but I would like to have your, I mean, your vision on what will be also the, the future marketing, the future communication with all these big changes on electricity world. Oh, so this is an easy question. <laughs> God, I don't even know where to start. This, that's a book. In, I think that's the, I think it's the beauty of this opportunity. I think it's a, it's in a book that'll be written by all of us. Uh, first, I'm a, I'm a I, I just sold my smart car. I had a Brabus 4.2 edition. I loved it, and so now that I now that I know it's going to go all electric, I was I was because I was thinking about buying it again. So that's that's good to know. Uh, on the other side of, of of the coin, you know, there's. I call it, I call this disruption that's happening, not just in e-mobility, but in everything, the new Kodak moment. Uh, and if you think about what happened with Kodak, it wasn't that they just missed going to digital, right? Because obviously Daimler gets the future. And so do a lot of automakers. Uh, minus one that's made in Italy. I think they're still arguing about whether or not the future could be electric. Uh, and I've had that debate with them too. Uh, but let's... Let's look at the Kodak moment from a different angle. The Kodak moment really failed when executives felt that investing in digital was going to cannibalize their film business, right? And so you see that happening with automakers today, that it's only a small percentage of investments that are being made into e-mobility because they don't want to cannibalize their net revenue that's happening on the combustion side. No problem. The other side of the Kodak moment is once if, if for those who are old enough to remember, like me, once digital photography became a thing, it changed the consumer relationship with taking pictures. And Kodak completely missed that too because they were all about nostalgia, memories, everybody had that family member who kept pictures in a box and they'd come out at family occasions, oh, remember this? And now today, think about, think about how many pictures you have on your phone that you are never, ever going to see again, right? <laughs> Never. I took pizza of my pasta last night, pictures of my pasta last night. I was so excited. I mean, I did. I show it to everyone at yeah, home. <laughs> but that, it, 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 shifted, it shifted the human relationship with photography from memories to experiences, right? And so I think about the Kodak moment as understanding at an executive level from a car maker, how are you going to communicate the promise of tomorrow without cannibalizing your business today? And that, I don't have an answer for that, but this is where I'm exploring, is that I know the solution is that we have to make electricity sexy. I think about what you know, Formula One in the early days, I mean, how many of the drivers can you name that you used to follow all the time? They were celebrities, they were rock stars, and, and you know, that has to happen. All of these things have to happen, and there also have to be rock stars on boosted boards and rock stars on jump bikes, and like, we need to see how cool it is, and, and then companies should be funding that, not just through content, but in the same way that they do for events, is funding that lifestyle, funding those tastemakers, funding those influencers to be out in front of everybody, showing, riding around and saying, oh, what, what's that? I gotta get that. And, and popularizing that also through media, traditional media, not just digital, but also getting it in the hands of the YouTube celebrities and letting them have fun with this stuff. I, it's, it has to be a full on assault on tradition. Thanks. So, um, sorry, there's one lady I didn't actually introduce at the beginning, Isabella. This is all her party. Um, she, she's the head of digital communications at Enel, and she's put this whole thing together. And I, I introduced everybody except her. So anyway, she'd like to ask a question. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Ryan. I actually have a question for Brian. Um, about uh, mobility as a service. I mean, if uh, it's going to be a service, um, who is going to lead uh, this market? Uh, and like the car manufacturer like Tesla or who owns the software like Uber or like Lynch or, you know, other companies? What do you think is going to happen? Let me get my crystal ball. There's, there, I don't think it's going to be any one thing. I think it's going to be a lot of things that happen 
in synchronicity. I'll, and, I, and one of the players that I think is going to help this is actually going to be Domino's Pizza, uh, which I think is a sin to say in Italy. But they are, <laughs> they are considered to be one of the most innovative companies in the world right now, much like uh, Netflix and Blockbuster. They're the Blockbuster. Right? In their headquarters, they have 800 employees, and 400 of those employees are software engineers. And so they're investing in software as a way to become a better pizza company, which sounds weird. If you talk to Starbucks, which I think is also a sin to say in Italy, they consider themselves not as a coffee company. They consider themselves as a mobile technology company. And so that all of their innovation happens on the mobile device, and then that plays out in the stores. And so I think you're going to have a lot of these things. So Domino's, for example, is investing in e-mobility for the delivery standpoint. They're looking at first a fleet of, of delivery uh, vehicles that, can, that are electric, but more so they're simultaneously investing in, a, in autonomous delivery electric vehicles, which I think are, are super interesting. Once you start to see that in your pizza delivery, it, it becomes like, wow, I, I, I could use something like that. You really start to see new possibilities. But Uber and Lyft, make no mistake, are outspending, out-investing, out-thinking car manufacturers right now because they have to. They're, they're, they see their Kodak moment on the horizon, right? Because their whole business model is based on combustion vehicles. And our whole conversation today is talking about shifting and phasing those out. And then at the same time, you're going to see automakers, like they are investing today, see that they're also in potential of being disrupted and over-invest, not just in acquiring startups or partnering with startups, but also looking and exploring in new business models, creating new companies, creating new brands that don't cannibalize their combustion sales today, but start to open new markets and opportunities. Well done. Hello. I accident. I, I don't know, by mistake, uh, forgot to make the presentation on... Uh, <laughs> On the beginning, so I'm a Christian, I'm from Romania, and I'm a blogger for, for uh, almost 10 years now. I have two questions. Um, for, uh, first, how far do you think is the technology that will charge a car wirelessly when uh, on the road? And the other question, do you think that the fact that the engine of an electric car uh, does not sound like an engine of a classic car could make could be a danger for the pedestrians. Uh, I don't know. I think maybe for the elderly people or the drunk people who are <laughs> walking on the streets. Thank you. Wireless technology for charging is, uh, is, is under study. I mean, how far down the road, uh, like, like I said before, being, having been disrupted by technology, I don't, I don't do any more uh, this sort of... Uh, um, forecasts. It's not going to be down the road in the next five uh, to, to eight years. Uh, in the next five to eight years what will happen is that you will continue to have the current charging uh, which will be polarized from uh, slow charging at home or in the office where you park and you charge and then faster and faster charging uh, uh, outside, uh, outside home because the batteries will, um, the battery packs will become um, bigger and bigger. The second question was about the sound of the, the sound. I mean, the sound, I, I, I leave to Brian. I think it's, it's a massive marketing opportunity for somebody uh, from some kind of car manufacturer to, to have a, a sound of electric mobility. Because it's true. It's a ma I think I, I look at the ninja, the ninja marketing guys who admire uh, a lot. Uh, it, it's a massive opportunity. I mean, uh, sound makes brands. And we, we, we all know that there's a lot of brands. So the ones that will be able to make this nice silence, a silence which is heard, I think we'll have a pretty good brand proposition. But maybe Brian can. Thank you. Well, first of all, I think that's cool that you've been blogging for 10 years because that means you're, you're OG. That's, uh, that's pretty, that's, I, I think that's what, 2008 when you started? That yes, is yes. Uh, I was 15, 15 years old. That's even, that's even cooler. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> um, there's a movie in the United States, I don't know if you've seen it yet, uh, that talks about this exact thing. That they were starting a company. Kevin, uh, Kevin James, I think is his name. I'll have, to, I'll have to Google it after this. They were starting a, a startup that was designed to sell to auto manufacturers the sound for electric vehicles. And they were 
struggling with how to how to make it sound really good, and they were going through all these experiments. And I th I remember watching that movie, saying, "Is this is this a movie or a documentary?" Because I think <laughs> this this that's really a cool idea. Of course, you should have sound. I mean, transportation. I mean, for some, it's just getting from A to Z. But I think for others, it's a sensory experience, right? I ride motorcycles. I I my car has a convertible top. I want I want to hear and experience every aspect of transportation. Uh, even in the, 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 the sight scene that I did today, I'm not on my phone looking at the screen. I'm looking outside and I'm listening and to everything. And there's one bit that, that I'll, I'll share with you because I don't have an answer to what's going to – maybe she knows more than I do on this. Uh, not to put you on the spot. Uh, is the idea, though, of communicating to pedestrians. So as I, I ride Harley Davidsons. And, and they, they went on a tour uh, – with their electric motorcycle. And I think everything everybody said was, that sucks. This, that's not Harley Davidson. And for them, it was, it's a really sexy bike. I, I would consider riding it for a different type of reason, but they also had the sound issue. And then I started to think about work that I was doing in researching self-driving cars. And some companies started to hire anthropologists to work on the, the, the self-driving car projects. And I thought, that's really interesting. Why are you hiring anthropologists? And they were trying to understand because a self-driving car comes with it a whole new paradigm of pedestrian-based transportation. So understanding that when I'm walking and I see a car that does not have a driver, I don't know what you're going to do. I don't know what that car is going to do. Can I cross the street? Is, does it know that it's a red light? And so they're looking for, as to new ways to invent how a car can talk to a pedestrian, to let, to let you know I see you, to give you some form that I'm going to stop, to give you some form that I'm going to make a lane change and you might not see me. So there, there's a whole new form of communications that don't exist in cars right now that are going to come out as a way of communicating back to pedestrians. I, I think that maybe, maybe automotive companies have to hire anthropologists. Maybe that's what it is. Thank you. Uh, hi. Um, again, thank you for your for your keynote. It was incredibly nice to hear. Uh, I agree on 99% of what you said for the vision of the future. Uh, I've been studying uh, uh, electric mobility since a while. I I was running a company that was a is a manufacturer of traditional motorcycles, bikes, e-bikes. Still sells a lot. But then I set up a new company that makes shared mobility, uh, electric shared mobility. So I, I'm 100% sure that the future is going toward a shared use of vehicles. I'm 100% sure that uh, cities will take benefit of it. I know that for every shared car, there are 15 less cars, private cars around. That's great. That means the footprint will reduce and improve the quality of life of everybody. Uh, of course, everything is going to be is going to be electric. I'm sure that in 20 years' time, Ferrari, Lamborghini, Porsche will be electric as well, not making, making noise, but that, that's the trend, and everybody will follow it. I'm not sure that the future also is going to be on uh, autonomous driving. I'm very afraid about the period, the 20 years period that will be between the introduction of first models till the day that every car will be uh, autonomous driven, and uh, in that period, it will be especially in cities where like South and Southern European cities where driving is a, is a, a sport, uh, that will be really, really dangerous for, ma for many people. So there might, we might find uh, the, the way to connect somehow also old, old cars and try to, to make safer the, the, the experience of driving around, around cities. Thanks. Well, first, congratulations on even being part of the innovation of this whole discussion. I mean, your, your company is by design, changing the future and making the future possible today. So congratulations. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't have an answer. I, I will, I'll give you, the, I'll give you the, the truth is that I, Mercedes was the first self-driving car that I was invited to go in. Uh, and that was in Silicon Valley where Mercedes has a, a research and development center. And every year I get invited to test drive the latest autonomous car. Test drive, I guess, is the wrong word. Be test driven. I'm driven. Uh, the first one I'll never forget, and this is many, many years ago. We're driving in a very dense area of Silicon Valley, 
and I could feel the car trying to figure out, should I stop? Should I turn left? You know, and, and real things that were the, were the problem, like the sun hitting the sensors or trees blocking the stop signs. Uh, but I was taken to, two years later I was in the desert where I got to sample um, a, a level three self-driving car, uh, almost level four. And we went for about 100 kilometers in the desert, 100% autonomous. And I sat in the driver's seat, and I never, I never took any worry in it. It was instantly calming. It was instantly relaxed. So in that experiment, I think what I could learn and what I could use to predict the future is that in less dense areas, self-driving is going to be cons uh, consumerized. And it's going to be shared, right? Because I don't, I don't have to think about transportation as a sport all the time. Sometimes I might just need to get from here to there. In denser areas, there are pilots right now on fixed paths for self-driving cars. And I do see that as becoming very disruptive, and I do see that as starting to happen faster than, say, Uber self-driving cars where you can, I mean, even though, again, living in Silicon Valley, you can summon a self-driving Uber right now. Might not get it, but I also start to, when I think about the future of self-driving cars, there's no, there's no possible way that in our lifetime people are going to give up driving for sport. But th we are going to see an adoption of a new relationship with transportation. I don't think anybody has fun uh, sitting, <coughs> excuse me, c c commuting for an hour to get to the city and an hour going home. That's two hours that you could have back in your life if something else is driving you. Uh, and we all can't afford to have drivers. So I do think that lifestyle changes are going to accelerate the adoption of self-driving cars. I, I do see self-driving as being introduced to services first before we see it as being ownership. And I 100% see the rapid adoption of self-driving shared vehicles at some point in the future. Uh, and that, to what extent is the relationship between owned and shared and then also driving versus self-driving, those will play out. But that technology exists right now. And I've been in a good now 20 different autonomous vehicles, and I can't wait to get one. And I'm a driving enthusiast, so I can't wait to get one. Forty percent. Wow. Right, ladies and gentlemen, we've come to the end of our, and I'll focus on in Rome. It's uh, just gone five o'clock here, um, and I'm going to hand over to Isabella to wrap up and to talk to you about the next focus on. But I would just like to say thank you so much to everybody, Brian, particularly Alberto, and to all of you, because the only reason why these NL focus on meetings work so well is because we have active, engaged, interested, and curious participation from people from around the world who bring different perspectives and we love the the debate and the, the provocation and the uh, and the discussion and the thoughts so thank you very much to all of you guys for coming it's really fantastic to have you here and as we were saying actually just before we came in starting to form a little community of people who come to these NL focus ons all around the world it's really wonderful to see faces old faces back in the crowd and the new faces uh, who join us so thanks very much to all of you and Isa, to you and your team, well done for organizing it, and thanks thank very much. You, thank you, thank you. Well, since uh, Ryan already thanked everyone in the room, I will thank uh, all the people that is actually following, following us at streaming, because uh, what is amazing is like uh, the last focus zone that we had in Brazil, uh, in Goiania, was followed by 100 uh, 180,000 people around the world. So uh, I always like to say that it's like two big Olympic stadium full of people cheering up Rome, of course, uh, like, <laughs> like we like to see and say this week. 
And um, so I would love to um, tell you about the next Focus On that is going to happen um, actually in Silicon Valley, the 14th of May in San Francisco. And uh, we are going to be there um, and we are going to have uh, the father of the open innovation, Harry Chesborough, that is going to um, have uh, his keynote speech. And, uh, and it's going to take in place uh, uh, where we have uh, uh, our innovation hub. So um, the next stop is going to be San Francisco and more to come, of course. Thank you again and uh, see you very soon. Ciao.